It's so good to see you. Welcome everyone to our Joel and Bolt series uh, with the Lehigh Valley Ad Club. This is our first episode and I am here with Camille Murphy. Um, Camille, if you can introduce yourself and we'll start off with our first question of how do you take your coffee? Awesome. Um, I, my name is Camille Murphy and I am an associate professor of graphic and interactive design at Moravian College. Um, and I love my job and I love the Lehigh Valley. <laughs> and are you a coffee drinker? Yes. All the Very time. much so. You remember having me in class. I always have a coffee in my hand. Yes, absolutely. Always. It's just part of, it's just part of the look. <laughs> <laughs> it's so yes. complete. Um, so yes, I had, um, uh, you were my professor uh, through all, all th uh, three years at Moravian. Um, so I know you from the academia world, um, but I know your background, you've worked in as a designer in so many different fields. Um, could you kind of walk us through where you started and maybe what your favorite position has been? Um, okay, well, I studied, um, I have a BFA from Kutztown University. Um, and then after that, I moved to New York City and I got a master's degree in communication design with a digital focus. And um, my first job as a designer was at Penguin Books. Um, and I worked there for a couple of years um, doing book design as an assistant designer. Um, from there, I went to Marvel Comics where I was the graphic designer and um, worked on things like graphic novels and um, merchandise, editorial, um, some branded things. And then from there, I briefly worked at Barnes and Noble Publishing and I worked on Spark Notes, which was an odd job. Um, then I ended up at um, Simon & Schuster um, at Nick Jr. and Nickelodeon um, at their imprints and worked on um, children's books and merchandise for um, Nickelodeon and Nick Jr. Um, television programs. And um, around that time, I started teaching. In the evening, I taught um, night classes at a um, small private school called Catherine Gibbs in New York City. Um, and uh, I realized I really enjoyed teaching. Um, I was so young, I think that was probably the only teaching position I could find um, because I had sort of graduated high school early and college early and grad school early and was working full time as a designer at 21. Um, so I think I started teaching night classes when I was maybe 23 or 24. Um, and then um, fast forward, I moved to California and um, ended up working in an ad agency called Morris, um, which was a really great experience. Uh, they had some great clients. So then, so basically it was like I was on the internal side of um, large corporate environments. And then when I moved to California, I ended up on more on the agency side. Um, and our clients were Sony, the NFL. We had some really great clients. Um, I ended up primarily working on Sony. Um, and that was a great experience. Um, also in California, I continued teaching night classes. I taught um, at Point Loma Nazarene um, College. And I also taught at San Diego City College. Um, I was pretty involved with AIGA out there. And just really immersed in design. Um, then I moved back to New York City, um, and my first job when I got back, I, I worked at HBO in their internal marketing group for a while, um, and I was freelancing then. So uh, I started freelancing and teaching, so I uh, started splitting my time between the two. I um, freelanced at HBO, um, where else? Um, Upright Citizens Brigade Theater. Um, uh, oh, magazines. I was working at Guitar World, Revolver, Guitar Aficionado magazines, um, and really enjoying that. Um, and then I also really started focusing on teaching as an adjunct um, in New York City. I started teaching at Pratt Parsons, NYU, 
St. Joseph's College. And then I also taught at two um, community-based um, places in the city, one called General Assembly and another one called Third Ward, um, where I would teach seminars. So um, for a while there, my schedule got really crazy because I was like working at Revolver Magazine and then teaching... I think at one point I was teaching like a class at Pratt of a class at Parsons and then working at Revolver like almost full time as a freelancer and my hours were just <laughs> really crazy. Um, and then um, from there, uh, so anyway, then I decided I wanted to switch that and focus more on teaching and I applied for full-time teaching positions. And strangely, uh, Moravian was the first place I applied to. And I got a tenure track teaching position in Pennsylvania, um, not far from where I grew up. I grew up in the Poconos. So this area is just so familiar to me. And I, I love being back um, as much as I can be. And um, I took the position at Moravian. And since then, I... Um, sort of built my freelance work into being a little bit larger and I started working with another um, gentleman that owns a design firm called Hammer and Nail and then he and I sort of merged forces and um, had Hammer and Nail for um, the past four or five years um, and then simultaneously <laughs> it sounds like I'm doing so many things but simultaneously I uh, I've been working in the studio of Seymour Quast um, Pushpin the legendary Pushman Studios um, for about five or six years. And I just feel so blessed to have landed in that position. I had written him a crazy cover letter that was basically like, I wrote all about how I would be fun to sit next to because I figured everyone was going to apply for that job um, and everyone would have the same qualifications. <laughs> um, and I guess I stood out and he thought I was funny and um, I've been working with him ever since, and that's just been uh, a great experience. So um, now I'm currently um, working with Seymour, teaching at Moravian, um, and just really um, enjoying design. It's going going well. I, I'm psyched, especially Moravian and Bethlehem. It's just such a great place to be. Yeah, there's an awesome there's an awesome design community here. Um, that I, I felt at Moravian and now feel as a, as a professional. Um, and I love that you, you brought up that you just want to be someone cool to sit next to, because I remember, I remember that so vividly from, from class as your, maybe if nothing else, your number one advice was just be the cool coworker that you want to sit next to. Like you have to be likable, um, and design, whether you're on the agency or, or, um, in-house Side. I think that's like that's really important um how have you I'm, I'm interested to hear how have you seen the design community change over the past year um it's it's something that everyone working from home um design is really well suited to to working remotely but they're also you you lose some of that in-person collaboration um do you have any thoughts on how how you've seen that change um, over the past year, or what has been or what has been good or bad about it, maybe? Yeah. So, I mean, everything has gone online. Um, I'm working primarily over Zoom. Um, the college um, is hybrid. Moravian um, has classes in person, and then it has some classes online. The classes I'm teaching are all online, so I'm teaching through Zoom, um, and I think. There are pros and cons to that. One of the positives, I think, is that the class can be recorded and posted and students can, um, especially if I do like a really long two-hour demo on how to do something complicated in InDesign or WordPress, um, students can watch the video back and, you know, <laughs> scroll it yeah. and see what I was doing. And um, I think that that's new and, and great. And I think it's really helping students um, engage with the material. Um, I also think one thing that's cool about Zoom is um, you can ask for a remote control of a screen and I can go onto someone's computer and help them remotely. So it does replicate the in-class experience to a certain extent. But I would say that um, 
you know, the, the challenges are just the lack of in-person contact and um, something's lost in the critique environment online. Um, there's something about a critique where you print everything out and you hang it on a wall and you stand in front of the work and discuss it that feels conversational and um, really allows people to engage um, with the work in a way that for some reason I just feel like is lost online. Um, maybe because it's just like you're looking at all the little tiny faces in Zoom um, and it's harder, I mean, it's harder to people to like virtually put their thumb up to raise their hand to speak and you have to turn their mic on and you know, whatever. It just sort of loses the momentum of a proper critique um, in a way that I just don't think it, it can be replicated. Um, I think students are, are experiencing that and, and us in the professional world are experiencing that too. Um, yeah. Is there um, a favorite project that you have released um, that I, I would love to hear about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned, I've been doing some work with um, Seymour and Pushpin Studios. And um, recently, um, Seymour uh, released um, a project with Moleskin, the notebook publisher. And one of the things that Moleskin has been doing that's been pretty cool is inviting artists and designers to publish their notebooks. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of like people you think of Moleskin as a notebook that they can use, but these are notebooks that are finished. So you can just like look at someone else's notebook. Yeah. And um, the Moleskin book that Seymour ended up doing um, was entitled Seymour Quas Inspiration and Process and Design. And um, it was just wonderful to um, help to organize all of his sketches and um, the content for this sketchbook. Um, and one of the things that we brainstormed for the book, um, and I think it was originally Stephen Heller um, wrote the foreword and was involved, but um, Stephen and Seymour, um, uh, and I, as much as I can contribute to Seymour Heller, uh, I mean, to Seymour <laughs> and uh, Stephen Heller, like, I'm not going to say that I contributed much, but um, the, the coolest thing about the book um, was Seymour um, included his, um, uh, uh, his proposals that never got made. So there's a whole section in the book that is um, unpublished proposals. So a big part of uh, what Seymour does is um, books. He does children's books and um, all sorts of books. And he's always in some state of proposing a book or um, working on a book or sending a book to press. And um, to, to before working with him, I'd seen that from the outside and he's just so prolific. He's done over 50 books. And how do you do that in a lifetime? And then once you work for him, you realize, oh my gosh, like, at any given time, he has seven or eight proposals out, you know, and publishers either pick them up or they don't, and they sort of end up in this folder. And he had this really amazing folder with like, I, I don't even remember how many unpublished proposals, but it was like astounding how many unpublished proposals. And my small contribution to the book was like, let's take a screenshot of this folder with all of these unpublished books because it, to see them all in a list there it's it, it was crazy i mean it was l at least 25 proposals that just never got made and these are almost fully formed books um that were just never picked up and i thought it was really um great to include that in the sketchbook um for inspiration because i think we're used to just seeing the thing that does get published yeah and and just sort of thinking like oh like how would i ever do that and when he chose to share his folder of unpublished books. You just sort of realize, oh my gosh, like for every proposal he's sending, obviously they're not all getting made. And I think that that could be really encouraging to other designers that, you know, maybe your first four or five proposals don't get accepted, um, but be like Seymour and just keep, <laughs> keep, keep making more proposals and um, maybe they'll get picked up. Um, so, it just, uh, that was just such a great project to get to work on. And it was just so cool. It went, um, 
it was printed and um, was available for purchase in July. So it was also released sort of during the pandemic, um, which is maybe one of the first projects I worked on that like had a big release with Moleskin. Um, you know, you can buy it on Amazon, um, you can buy it in bookstores and it's, you know, it's just sort of like, it's such a, there's something about COVID that just sort of like lowers the, the volume of a, of a book release, you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't know that it just flew off the shelves, but hopefully it is. Um, but anyway, that was my favorite project that I've worked on since, since COVID. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's such a fun project. I love that. There's such a world of, um, unused creative out there and, and, um, unpicked up proposals. And yeah, I think that's definitely inspiring. Um, because every project that you work on or every proposal that you send is not going to be your best one, but you have to send multiple before, before one hits. Um, so my last question, um, just wrapping up, we are asking all of our guests, what is keeping you motivated right now? Um, I would have to say just feeling like I want to be a contributing member of my community and of the world and do what I can to um, stop the spread of COVID and participate in my government and um, just try and be a good citizen. Um, I would also say um, surfing. I'm really, really into surfing. <laughs> And it's like one thing that I'm able to do during the pandemic. Um, not many people know that you can surf in New York City. And I go out to the beach here and I just paddle around. And it. Um, I always joke, if you look out at the ocean and you don't turn around, you could be at any beach in the world. So that <laughs> keeps me motivated. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it keeps me very motivated to... Um, just to have some some time to exercise that's COVID safe and um, uh, a way to spend some time in nature. Is yeah, maybe yeah. That was motivated. that's um that's such a beautifully balanced answer to 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 do what you can and to to put the work in to to be a good citizen, but also take the time that you need to to unplug. And we all we all need to find those those ways. Yeah. I would also say my students keep me motivated. I mean, just logging into class and seeing all their faces, I just feel like, oh my gosh, like I want to do a better job to help them all and um, just get to know them. And it's always a new and engaging experience. So that, that also keeps me motivated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. I know I just, I learned so much from you being my professor and look up to you as, as such a mentor. So I hope um, everyone else watching this video can learn something from you and um, stay tuned for our next episode. <laughs>